Welcome to the Ephesiology Podcast, a podcast dedicated to the study of the early Christian movement and its implications for the church today. Today, we're with Michael, our resident physiologist, and I'm Matt Till in the suburban sprawl of Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Andrew is currently off this week. Where so, is that boy? Where is Andrew? Do you remember the, the I don't know, Michael, if this is probably, this is definitely not your generation, but uh, where in the world is Carmen San Diego? Oh, right. Where in the world is Andrew Johnson? Uh-huh. Andrew no, would get that. He'll appreciate it. Where Where is Waldo? Where, well, yeah, okay, so I, that's fair. Where's yeah. Waldo? Yeah, yeah, where's Andrew? Yeah, really. Uh, Andrew, to- I, Andrew, I hope you're safe wherever you are today. <laughs> well, welcome to what did I say? December forty third, twenty twenty. Yeah, uh, Boy, yeah we it- thought that we left twenty twenty <laughs> in the past. <laughs> Goodness. This, this is Groundhog Day. It just keeps on going. It just keeps yeah. on going. You know, by the way, if you know the movie Groundhog Day, right, uh, from the 90s, uh, Bill Murray, that uh, was filmed actually uh, in a little town called Woodstock, Illinois, which is uh, 15 minutes from my house. Wow. So, uh, that's a, that's kind of like, there's a, you can do the Woodstock square walk and they've got plaques everywhere as to where, uh, Bill Murray, you know, here, he, he stood here and this was the house that was, <laughs> it's that's just something quaint funny. little towns do all the time, you know? Mm-hmm. And then they, they came out before the Super Bowl this year and refilmed, uh, you know, they did a, a Jeep commercial and they flew Bill Murray out for it. And, uh, they just kind of revisited, uh, the movie a little bit with him in a, uh, riding around the, the town in, in the countryside a little bit with uh, a couple of a Jeep vehicle and stuff. So it was kind of fun to, to see that. Woodstock, Illinois. Woodstock, Illinois. Yeah. So mm-hmm. uh, not too far from uh, where I'm at. Um, but, you know, Michael, here we are, 2021. Um, the As predicted, the chaos would continue. Um, mm. And boy, has it. Um, the time this, uh, podcast is dropping, it's, uh, a week following or just nearly a week after, um, you know, what we saw go down on TV, uh, last Wednesday and, yeah. uh, on the Capitol and just really, um, I don't know, what was your reaction, Michael, when you were, you know, I, just kind of following the news, um, Twitter, Facebook, uh, live TV, what, what were you kind of just feeling in the moment when you were watching this? You know, I, it was, I mean, it was surreal. Um, I had texted you guys while that was all going on. And here I am writing this chapter on Dietrich Bonhoeffer and, uh, and critical theory and really wrestling with, you know, what, what is the response of the evangelical church to political, economic, and societal turmoil? And then, and then this all blows up. Uh, on Did television. we get it right? Did we get it oh, right, my Michael? my goodness. Well, we got the political, economic, and societal turmoil right. Uh, <laughs> how we're reacting to it—that's the question that we're wrestling with. But boy, um, it was—it was really one of those surreal moments. And then at the same time, you know, I'm thinking about our podcast uh, from last week, and here we're talking about the continued struggles that we think that we'll face, and. Um, uh, and it's like, you know, these things are coming true. Um, and not that we're thinking that we're prophetic or anything, but, you know, if, if, if we're students of culture and we're, stu- and we really pay attention to what's going on around us, I think at least at some level, we could uh, predict what we're headed toward. But to be honest, I, you know, I could have never imagined a group of people swarming onto the Capitol steps like they did and then breaking in to the the Capitol. And um, yeah, just amazing. Hey, what about you? What, I know we were texting back and forth while all this was going on, but what was yeah. going through your mind? Yeah, you know, I, I was a range of emotions. I was, um, I mean, honestly, it was it was very disturbing. Uh, no matter what, I, I was very disturbed by it, and it was bringing back some of the memories even for over the summer. You know, we were seeing uh, a lot of these mm-hmm. these race uh, and Black Lives Matter protests, 
but then when they, you know, when they, when they, when they became riots, you know what I mean? Like we had a, we had a couple of moments, uh, two big nights in Chicago on two different occasions that it went down and, you know, you kind of have this like, wow, like this is, I mean, I'm bewildered. Um, I'm, I'm sad. I'm afraid I'm angry, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, so a lot of that emotion just kind of came back again when I was watching it yesterday. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's, yeah, that's wild. I, I, I mean, I was looking at the pictures. I, I had watched a little bit of Trump's speech leading up to that. And, um, you know, it, it was so clear that he was stirring the pot and getting people riled up. Um, I didn't think that it would come to what it did, but... Um, so, yeah, I mean, in that sense, my perspective was a bit of um, at the same time being shocked, but not completely surprised. I think what was disheartening to me as I was watching the images and the media wasn't focusing on this at all, but it was just it became so apparent that among the Trump banners and uh, all the Trump paraphernalia and regalia and, and so on that every once in a while you'd see a, a Jesus saves or a Jesus flag or somebody with a cross. And I thought, oh, my goodness, that that does not look anything like Christianity. I, I, I mean, I, I think Jesus was appalled that his name was propagated yeah. in what was going on on that that wednesday that that is and what, that was heartbreaking yeah Just, I, i'm with i'm with you and and that's actually what started getting me really riled up <laughs> internally and i'm looking at this and i'm like this mm. is uh, this is not the heart of god I, this is not you know <laughs> we we're just getting we were getting ready to get on i was just joking yeah. do you think paul would have been there what what would paul do <laughs> <laughs> well, the apostle yeah, Paul, right. if this is 50, right. you know what I mean? What was, was Paul there? You know, what, was he on the steps uh, waving the flag that Jesus saves? I mean, you know, no, not at all. I, I mean, he, not at all. I mean, I can't imagine anyone during the new Testament time being in that position. I, I mean, certainly there were times when Paul was brought before uh, government officials um, but he was never leading a riot of Christians to uh, instigate some type of insurrection uh, against a political system. It, I mean, that just wasn't, it, you know, the context was different. It wasn't a democracy and all of those other things. But I just cannot imagine um, any of the New Testament early church believers uh, acting the way that we saw Christians, presumably, Christians acting uh, that Wednesday. Yeah. So, so here's what I'm thinking and, and kind of going back to our, our episode about new years and, and kind of the predictions coming up into this year. One of the ones I made was about uh, increased tribalism. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and this is the moment like th that <laughs> it's just so weird. Like we, we, we recorded it, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago and then we aired it the day before this happened. And, this was the moment in my mind as I'm watching this go down for the reasons we're already talking about, but especially, um, you know, just seeing those flags raised that this is where the tribalism occurs. This is where it starts. This is, this is the decision moment. And, and this is what I've been wrestling with now since that time. And I've given it a few more days to kind of marinate on and thinking through, but it's like, this is the moment where, and, and we're recording this at the end of the week. Um, and so Sunday hasn't happened. And um, pastors who are getting up in front of their congregations on Sunday now have something to say. Um, mm -hmm. And and there, there now needs to be, it's like th there seems to be a forced, which side are you on kind of moment here. And, and I don't, I don't know if that's a right dichotomy. I don't know if there's a, a true third way. I've heard other people try to proclaim a third way. Um, but I, I don't know. It, it sounds kind of weak to me. Some of the arguments I haven't heard a compelling <laughs> third way option that doesn't say you're going to have to be on the left or the right. And, and, uh, and, and I don't mean to draw it politically. It's just, are you going to align yourself with what happened on Sunday? Are you going to defend it? Are you going to stand behind it? Um, are you going to dismiss it? Uh, or are you going to condemn it? Um, 
And, and do you know what you're condemning actually? And do you know the depth to what you would need to condemn it to? Um, and so I, I think about that and I go, this is really difficult times, but this is where the tribalism continues. We've already been on this pathway and these, this is the tinder box. This is the, this is the spark now that all of a sudden creates it. And, um, mm-hmm. and, and so I wanted to hear from you, Michael, because I think, you know, I, I value your perspective on this and, and I think this is where we get that first you know, century that New Testament kind of approach, like there, there was this kind of dyna- dynamic occurring that really led up to oh, 70 AD that, you sure. know, we're seeing something like this play out now today in, Amer- in America. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, you think even among Jesus's disciples, there were political zealots. Um, I mean, there were people with very strong political opinions that followed Jesus and and you know whether or not they were a part of what uh, happened in 67 AD at the beginning of the Jewish wars we don't know but certainly there were those who had those you know deep passionate political motivations that was they were just tired of uh, the reign of the Romans over Israel and they wanted to take control again and so they did and it didn't end well uh, for them. And yeah, I don't, I mean, it's hard to compare that history with our history. Um, we learn from history, most definitely. Um, there's rarely ever a one to one correspondence. But what is interesting to me, Matt, is that it, repeatedly throughout history, we see the same three things political, economic, and societal turmoil. I mean, it's just over and over and over again. And that we should expect and we should anticipate. Um, In fact, I think that's one of the primary reasons why John, uh, who, by the way, I, you know, as I've argued in the physiology, who uh, leaves Jerusalem because of the war, um, I I would not take it so far as to say that he's a, a political refugee in Ephesus, but I'm sure there would be somebody who would make such a claim. But he does, he does move to Ephesus at that time period. Um, but not too long after that, you know, some 20 years or so afterwards, he writes Revelation. And I think that was a part of his motivation in writing Revelation is to prepare those seven churches in Asia Minor to continue to expect there to be political, economic, and societal turmoil. And uh, the way in which he writes about this over and over and over again in, uh, in, with those images of the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls, just reinforces that this is the trajectory of all of history. Uh, we're always going to be going in that direction. And, uh, and so we should anticipate it. Doesn't mean that it exactly happens as it has in the past, but in some way, those three um, areas are going to experience turmoil. And, and I mean, we're most definitely experiencing that today in, in the United yeah. States. Yeah. Uh, do, those, do, do you feel like all three of those things tend to happen at the same time? Or is it, you know, it's just kind of a rotational basis? Oh, it certainly seems like in this past year, <laughs> uh, that yeah, well, all three if, have happened, hasn't it? Right. Well, yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, I mean, they're, they're, think back. I mean, think back a year ago. I was looking at some of our blogs and uh, and so on. Uh, that trying to remember what it was that we were writing about. Not that I had forgotten because it was so uh, shocking back then. But, you know, more than a year ago, we start with Galley's article in Christianity Today about Trump and his impeachment. And then we go into the plague. Uh, I mean, in, in interspersed in all of those, of course, we still have racial tensions, but then it's it, it, it is just exacerbated with George Floyd. And so all of that, I mean, you have the political, the economic, and the downturn because of the plague, mm-hmm. because of uh, COVID, and, uh, and the societal turmoil because of racial tensions. And yeah, yeah. perfect so, storm, perfect storm. 
So I want to talk about uh, you were you were just talking for a moment about re- you were referencing Revelation, and um, maybe we could just talk briefly about that. But um, I, we we could obviously have a whole other podcast on our eschatology, but um, I don't want to go that direction. But some people would hear this and hear you talk about Revelation and talk about you know uh, the seven spirits, the seven bowls of wrath, whatever you know. And all of a sudden we could get into this, and suddenly it's like, well, yes, this is all part of God's divine plan to bring about his kingdom, his new kingdom. Um, This is all part of his judgment upon the world. And some people would actually defend what went down for that very reason uh, and take a theological position in defense of. Um, What do we, what would we say to that? I mean, this is a, I mean, is this the message that that Paul and Jesus were and John, that John was trying to, 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 uh, to leave us? Yeah, I think two things, at least, maybe three, uh, in terms of the book of Revelation. I mean, it's clear John is writing, saying that uh, the time is near. Uh, that not chronologically here, he uses kairos, it, it, the timing, the, the setting, the context is near uh, for the fulfillment of uh, the completion of God's mission. And, uh, and that's what, how he introduces Revelation chapter 1. Um, but for us to, to derive from this um, some type of eschatological scheme uh, that um, is, is evidenced by the things that we're seeing, and it's only going to get worse, um, and so we need to prepare ourselves for getting worse. For, for this to get worse, is it might be a little bit taken out of context. I, I hold that Revelation was written for those seven churches in uh, that, you know, John or Jesus tells John to write to uh, the seven churches of Asia Minor. But I think there is a, you know, there's a historic part to it. There's an uh, apocalyptic part to it. And there's a prophetic part to it. And so um, I think the prophetic part of this is for us to uh, read Revelation with the view that uh, we are to endure, the church is to endure through these times. They're going to happen, uh, be faithful during those times, and stay on mission. Uh, God's purpose as sovereign of the universe through all of this turmoil is to make himself known. And, um, And that's the motivation here. And, and the church is the vehicle by which uh, uh, God is made known. And so as a church, you know, we need to stand up, stay on mission, uh, continue to proclaim uh, his glory, uh, continue to stand in the gap for issues of social justice, and continue to defend the faith. And, and that's the message that John is trying to get across to the churches in Asia. What do you think the message is for... Um, or maybe it should be for us. I, I think it, let me rephrase this. The, the, um, I, I believe, and, and I think you do too, um, that the evangelical church in America, the Western evangelical church is, is headed for a, um, <laughs> I don't know, a division, uh, a collapse, um, a, a significant upset at this point. Um, And we see it because we know it's happening within the context of our churches. Anybody who's listening to this right now knows it. Um, The church down the street, they wear masks. Ours doesn't. Um, Mm. The the people in our church stopped coming because we started requiring masks, um, you know, for, because of the pandemic, people are showing up and they're, they're being discipled on a nightly basis by different talk show hosts and they're, or they're listening to conspiracy theories and sharing it on Facebook. Um, it's happening internally in the church and it's happening between churches who we would historically assume are somewhat like-minded within the broad evangelical camp. And it's, it's headed to this place of a divide now. And this is where the tribalism kind of begins, kind of basically where we started here in this conversation. What is the message for the church 
Um, this is a two-part question. The first is, what's the message for us as Americans, as evangelicals, as Westerners? How do we move forward through this? And you've already started answering that question about faithfulness. And the second part about this is, what is the message we are unintentionally sending internationally to other evangelicals? And perhaps do we need to change course and learn from somebody else? Yeah, well, I mean, we've been talking about this for a little bit. Um, it, we do need to listen. I think the, the two places we need to listen. I, I think we need to listen to history because I think history can be a good rebuke for us and learn from that. But we also need to listen to brothers and sisters around the world and what they're trying to say to the American church. You know, the, the American church is a, is, um, a significant church in the world. And the American Evangelical Church in particular is a significant uh, church in the world, just in terms of uh, its scale, um, its wealth, but also its human resources. Um, we send more missionaries than any country in the world, uh, around the world. Uh, we send more resources than any uh, country in the world through the context of the church. And and so the, um, it, uh, yeah, I think it's important for us, though, not to uh, practice the old adage that he who has the gold makes the rules, um, because that's what tends to happen, is that because we control these resources and we're going to make the rules, we're going to tell everybody else what it is to be an evangelical. That what I think the proper posture here for us today is we need to listen to our brothers and sisters around the world and let them speak into us about what they see uh, in regards to who we are as American evangelicals. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's good. And, you know, I'm, we, we've been in part of this has been my journey of just even my encounters with, with you, even initially, Michael, is just your experience internationally and, and seeing the breadth of uh, belief, um, the the breadth of faith and its expression, and you know, even realize just uncovering my own Westernism, you know, if that's a thing, uh, you know, my and and just kind of understanding like, wow, I, I have a narrow view of uh, Christianity. I have a narrow view of of me uh, and humanity. And it's nothing that I actually ever sought out. I, I didn't intend it to be this way. I, I don't, you know, I don't intend to feel like I, I want a narrow view. I actually want a broad view. But what I thought was a broad view was actually very narrow. And it continued to be indoctrinated within me. And part of that is just our Western experience. Part of that's just American exceptionalism. Part of that is just pure consumerism, which is self, it's a self-fulfilling cycle and um, self-fulfilling prophecy um, where we just cycle things over and over again to continue to feed our own appetites um, and, you know, weak theology at the end of the day too. And so we, all these things combined kind of create this, this idol that I didn't even realize I was chasing. And suddenly mm -hmm. when the, the holes start getting poked, you know, those become threats initially, but then you come to realize, and actually, no, this is God's grace for me right now. This is his mm -hmm. good. Like he is, he's, I mean, that scripture that we love to quote, you know, in, in our evangelical church is about being refined, right. As gold from Job, right. When you've been tested, you will come out like gold. So it's like, like, we don't know testing. <laughs> this is its test. We were tested right. this last week, Christian. We were tested on the global scale. You had other countries who we usually look at and say, you, we, will, we will only recognize a fair and legitimate election and democratic process. They're telling that to us. They're lecturing us. It is time for us to sit mm. down. Sit yeah. down, America. Yeah. Sit down, Christian. Yeah. And I, Let's be tested. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and and to think about that testing in a proper way, too, because, it, you know, what there will be and we're, we're going to be seeing this if we're not seeing it already. There will be those who participated in Wednesday's event uh, who will feel like that they're the victims, that they're the persecuted, they're the martyred. Um, and uh, th that is not the case that it, clearly that is not the case. And I think we've said this before and it bears repeating the United States is not in the Bible. And so if we are Say deriving what? our, our, <laughs> if we're deriving our identity from this false sense that 
we have a special place in God's world, then um, then that's where we need to begin to change. I mean, that is the definition of, of anthropocentrism, um, that self-centered, self-righteous uh, idea that somehow God has made us exceptional uh, above any other nation. Um, that's just not the case. I mean, that can't be the case. God's not going to show favoritism like that to people. He he has most definitely blessed the United States. Um, he's blessed his people in the United States, but he has blessed his people around the world. Um, and, and so we we I, I think a major shift that has to happen is that we need to get back to a theocentric understanding of who we are. You know, we are who we are because of God, uh, not because of ourselves, not because we've made ourselves the way we are, not because of some uh, I- ideal uh, political system. Um, we are only by the grace of God uh, who we are, and we need to give him glory for that. And our focus needs to be on him, not on ourselves. Um, and and so, yeah, I, I mean, I'm I'm concerned about that for the church. Um, and I'm concerned about that, particularly for those who have, um, in, at, at some level, have been self-deceived to believe that their political actions are the actions of a Christian martyr. And, and that's just not the case. How much of this is just us just losing sight of the real mission? Well, I think that's, I think that's exactly it. I think we've lost sight of the mission. I mean, it seems like anymore that people think the mission is political, that we need to have the right person in that office in order to achieve the things that uh, God wants us to achieve. And that's not the case. I mean, that that's not the purpose of, it's not the purpose of the Christian for one. It's not the purpose of government. Government is to ensure that we as Christians do the right ethical things, do the good things. And, um, and we're not to look necessarily to government to enact those good things for us. But that's, in, in essence, what Christians have done. We've relegated our actions of good to government. And, uh, and we've left it in their hands. And now we're paying the price for that. I, I, at least my read of this is, is that um, some of this, too, is, of course, influenced by um, you know, this this chapter I just finished on uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the things that he was addressing in Nazi Germany and um, and just how focused he was on God. I mean, he was, I, I know I jokingly said this with you all, that he was the original ephesiologist. <laughs> um, I, 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 I mean, that's just purely a, a joke, but he was very theocentric in his view. And he did not look to the state to solve uh, problems for people. And of course, he couldn't. I mean, it was Nazi Germany. He wasn't going to do that. (laughs) But even even looking beyond Nazi Germany, he didn't find the solution in some new uh, form of state. His solution was in the church, uh, the communion of the saints. And, uh, And they were to live like Jesus. And so the two, uh, I think, important themes that we see in Bonhoeffer's writing is how Christocentric he is and how ecclesiocentric he is. It is the church acting like Jesus that is going to resolve the political, economic, and social turmoil of a nation. And until we, as a church in the United States, catch that vision, then then we're just going to continue and see what we're seeing. Uh, and I think it's going to get increasingly worse, increasingly tribal, Matt, as you have been saying, until we wake up to the reality that uh, we are not acting like Christ for one, and we're certainly not being the church uh, on the other hand. Yeah. You know, I, I don't uh, disagree with you. I just, um, I struggle because I, I think that, um, I think some people would hear you you say, I mean, what you're just talking about, like how the church is going to really kind of be, and I'm just going to simplify it, like really the hope of the world. Um, but it's this this notion of we influence change through other spheres of influence within the culture. So we influence change in politics. We influence change in academia. We influence change and bring about um, 
God's kingdom through these other, through these other things. And so some may actually continue to read and go, I'm not changing anything I'm doing because my mission is still to tell, to teach people uh, the difference between heaven and hell. And some people are in, some people are out and we need to figure out ways to tell more people that message. And if not legislate it. Um, and I think that's where we kind of go. Like we start kind of in this, like, the, you know, this, this idea of like, yeah, I'm theocentric. Yeah, sure. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm set on God's word, you know, worship. And actually I want to see everybody worship God. And because we kicked out, uh, we have gay marriage that's permitted because we, uh, abortions legal because we kicked out the 10 commandments out of uh, courthouses. Um, you know, we have liberal judges. These are all things that are condemning us. And these are the things that are not for God. And so I want all those things to change. So I'm going to bring it about what would we say? Like what, what's different about then those, what, you know, what's the other option then? Yeah. Well, I think that, and I mean, you're right on. Um, I think the other option is again for the, and I don't think that this is a difficult thing. Um, I think it's very simple. I think the other option is be, be the church, be who God intends us to be. Um, in that first century uh, th that the church formed, the church took care of those who were marginalized. They were very much involved in social justice. Uh, they, of course, they wouldn't use that term, but they were involved with the orphans, the widows, um, the slaves, and so on. Uh, they, they were the church, and they took care of each other, and they looked out for each other. And in times of crisis, like what we've uh, talked about before, uh, the, that uh, plague in uh, 163 AD, the church came alongside of those who were sick and they were standing in the gap for those. They were taking on the disease in order to care for people. Um, it, it was the church that was doing that. Um, it wasn't the state. The state was scared to death of it. And uh, and so there in, in our context today, and there it is a, a historic time period when this happened. It was in the, the 1940s that the church felt overwhelmed with the social issues um, that it had to confront. And it, in essence, relegated uh, its care for people to the state. And, and that was tragic, I think, um, on the part of the, the church. But that doesn't mean that we can't recover that uh, first century the idea of, uh, of, of, you know, defending those who need to be defended, uh, to feed the poor, to clothe the naked, to care for the homeless, and so on. Um, that has to happen it, it, for it, us today. You know, it seems to me, and, and I think part of the, um, part of the hard part of where we are and how we've, you know, how the timeline is advanced um, is government tends to be far more efficient and effective at doing those things at this point. What? <laughs> Wasn't it you who said that we were going to have a problem with the vaccine rollout? Yeah, and that we are. <laughs> government that, that but but, but let me ask you this. Efficiency? In, in, in comparison, let's say the vaccines were handed to every church and every corner. Would it get to everybody in time? It's hard to know. Yeah, right? well, that's a... Yeah, that, that's hard no, to know. Yeah, and, I, and and so and and here's the other thing is this is all this is all I'm asking. And just the point I'm I'm trying to make is that government has the ability to be effective and efficient in significant large ways, right? Mm -hmm. When we're talking about major population, the church tends to not be, especially when it's completely divided and disorganized, right? right. And fewer people are engaged with it. Yeah. No, right. yeah, I, I think you're 100 percent right. Because but we're we, not feeding the poor, yeah. we're not actually caring for our neighbor. Right. We're actually not seeking, you know, and I'm speaking very broadly. So I understand if you are a church who is doing this very actively, God bless you, continue, inspire the rest of us. We need those stories. <laughs> but in general, <laughs> we're not doing those things. Right. Right. Um no, so I you're 100 percent right. What discipleship, I think, is the answer. I, honestly, I think, again, it's that simple. Um, it's discipleship. And I'm just amazed. And we continue to have these conversations with people around the country, amazed at uh, the, the inability of many in the church to actually disciple other people. And uh, But I'm convinced that if we were able to, and if we actually did disciple other people to be, to be like Christ and to live like Christ, not to, to be like him as we think he is, but to be like him as he is, 
and to act like him as he acted, then, uh, then I mean, we would see incredible change in society. Um, but I think what's happened is, you, you know, we've, we have um, over time and because of contexts and circumstances and other influences uh, that we've institutionalized to such a point to where uh, we think that it's somebody else's responsibility to do those things while I sit and enjoy uh, what I might enjoy on, on a Sunday morning. Um, and now we're back but, but to, I think, now we're back to the APES conversation. Well, we're back to the APES conversation. We're back to, uh, you know, the conversation that we've been having about uh, whether or not we want volunteers or disciple makers. Um, all of those, I think, yeah. come into play here because, again, I mean, Wednesday happened and it didn't happen in a vacuum. And in, at, at some level, um, all of us bear some culpability to what happened on Wednesday. Um, Why? Yeah, well, they were granted, they were individuals who did it. They ultimately are culpable. But because of the context that we have allowed to emerge in the, the United States, particularly in the context of the church, that being namely the lack of discipleship, uh, the focus on uh, professionals to do the ministry and not pushing out leadership and ministry responsibilities to others, uh, the relegating of the care for the marginalized to governments and non-governmental organizations rather than uh, the church. All of that has has kind of set up what we saw on Wednesday at some level. Um, it, it wasn't something that happened all of a sudden. It, it's been the frog in the kettle. I mean, this has been a slow cooker for uh, decades, uh, but it's happened. And, uh, and we need to recognize that we as Christians, as the church in the United States, bear some responsibility to what we saw uh, there, because many of those people on the steps are going to claim that they were followers of Christ or are followers of Christ. Well, as we've said, Christ would not do what we saw on Wednesday. And if that's a person's understanding of what it means to follow Christ, then we as leaders in the church have failed in our responsibilities to disciple those people. Yeah. You know, um, you recently did a study um, uh, with, and took a, did a survey with some uh, international uh, individuals. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about it? Because there's something about, I want to point us to one of those results that you uh, received. And it's really about this idea of who, really those who are with us, or um, I should say the perception of international people who, and people groups, and what they perceive American evangelicals are. And the number of people who, you know, what they assume who we are for politically is, I think, already revealing. Yeah. Yeah. So we did this study. I, I developed a survey um, last September, I think it was. It was before the election because I wanted to get a, a better understanding of what those who are looking at us from outside are thinking about us and especially what they're thinking about American evangelicals. And so I sent this survey out. Uh, this is just the beginning. It's an ongoing survey. The, these are initial results. Um, I, I don't have a high level of confidence yet in the survey. I, I think we're somewhere between 80 and 86 percent percent confidence level. Uh, but but uh, in terms of the preliminary results, it, they are rather revealing. And so this uh, survey uh, was asked a number of questions uh, to these internationals and uh, I'm so thankful that so many have responded and look forward to, to others responded. But but uh, yeah, some of the things that I found uh, really particularly uh, revealing, and uh, we won't go through all this. I'll, I'll go through uh, some of these in a couple of blogs, I'm sure, over the next several uh, months. But, but um, it, one of the questions that I asked was uh, who they supported in the upcoming presidential election. And 
uh, 40, 46% of them re responded that they supported Biden and Harris, 34% uh, didn't have a preference either way, and, and uh, about 20% supported uh, Trump and Pence. Uh, but the perception that they had in terms of American evangelicals was that uh, the 84, 85, 86% of American evangelicals supported Trump, while only uh, 18, 19% uh, supported Biden. And and again, I mean, this is, it's interesting, it's not unexpected. Um, that of course was about the percentage that we saw in the last election, 84% of white evangelicals uh, supported uh, Donald Trump and his presidency. So we're not shocked by the that perception. Uh, it, what what became I think um, more interesting, at least for me and, and for us as we think about ephesiology, was the question that I ask about um, who evangelicals are. What should evangelicals be involved in? And I asked three questions because these are three that we're uh, talking about rather regularly on our podcast and in our writing. But in um, this, of course, coming out of Revelation chapter two, that uh, with the church in Ephesus, that Jesus, you know, commends the church in uh, defending the faith. He commends them for standing in the gap for the marginalized, and he warns them that if they don't recover the gospel proclamation, that they're they're going to have their lampstand removed. And so, those three areas I asked of these internationals, um, what their first what they believed uh, was a proper uh, position for an evangelical. So I asked, should evangelicals be involved in social justice? And 92% said yes. That's a high uh, number. Should evangelicals be way, involved? I mean, that's that a feels huge like a, number. That's a huge Oh, man, number. that is, that, it is. And if we take uh, and we add into that to the somewhat agree, then we're talking 97%. Of those outside of the United States, when they think about what evangelicals are, they should be involved in social justice. 98% uh, said that about evangelicals. Um, nearly, uh, well, over, uh, well, close to 90% uh, believe that evangelicals should be involved in gospel proclamation. And 90%, uh, 96%, or 99%, it looks like. 99% believe that evangelicals should be involved in defending the faith. And so that's their understanding of what an evangelical is. <laughs> uh, put that then beside their understanding of American evangelicals, and then we get this so, very So this is their, their perspective of what we are projecting as American evangelicals, asked right. essentially the same question, right? Right, right. It's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, are, are American evangelicals involved in social justice uh, was the question. And their perception is that uh, 63% uh, disagreed with this idea that Americans were involved, American evangelicals were involved in social justice. Um, not go. unexpectedly, they had a high higher view of uh, American evangelicals being involved in gospel proclamation and defense of the faith. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at nearly 80% on both accounts. But boy, I, I mean, the perception from the reality in, in the mind of the internationals that were surveyed, over 90% should be involved in social justice. Over uh, evangelicals, 90% should be involved in um, social justice, but the perception of um, the American evangelical is that, um, uh, you know, they, they see that, uh, or 63 percent of them do not see American evangelicals involved in social justice. That is a, that is a significant swing from the perception of what an evangelical should be about and then what they're actually seeing reflected and, and obviously mm -hmm. you're going to see some, some adjustments here and there um, within anybody, right? I mean, even if we were all to look at our own life and go, I know what I'm supposed to be, but I realize what I actually do is probably doesn't always match up to that. You know, I'm winning in some areas, losing in others. But that to me, as I look at that from an international perspective, I mean, that is a total loss. I mean, that is a, that, that's an eye-opening, eye-opening um, perception and um that's that's significant. 
I, I think it is, you know, and for me, it's encouraging as well uh, from the international perspective. I love the fact that that those uh, internationals that uh, we surveyed, that they really grasp the understanding that an evangelical should be involved in social justice. Uh, they get it. That, that's an important uh, question. Uh, that, that, I think that's a re really important point, Michael, because that is constantly up for debate in our country, isn't it? And there seems to be a fear oh, yes. in, amongst, uh, even within the camp, that we shouldn't be about that. We're going to offend. We're going to step, we're going to do something wrong. We're, we, that's not our area. We're not supposed to adjust the, you know, address that. And obviously that has been changing over the last decade and specifically rapidly as, as even other studies have come out that there seems to be an increase for that. But there's some just straight out rejection. But to hear the international world looking at us on the world stage saying, why aren't you about this? Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. point you're making, yeah. right? Sure. Right. Well, I, I think it's, I, hopefully it's the point that they're making. And I, I think it's a rebuke for us as an American church, um, as we're listening to our brothers and sisters around the world, that, that we need to recognize that, boy, a part of what it means to be evangelical is to be involved in these things. And we see that. I, I ask another question. There were a couple other questions. I didn't put them in this particular presentation, but um, uh, but there was the question about uh, should evangelicals care about the unborn? And the perception of those outside of the United States is that you know the overwhelming majority of American evangelicals care about the lives of the unborn. Um, we're looking at 90, 95, 96 uh, percent of those internationals who were surveyed look at American evangelicals as caring for the unborn. But the, the question that I put beside that one was, uh, what is the perception of American evangelicals when it comes to the lives of minorities? And boy, what a shift. I mean, you look at the graph, you know, you have this really high uh, the peak uh, for the care for the unborn, and then you look at the care for the lives of the minority, and we're talking about 17%. Uh, the perception of these internationals, or 17% of internationals who were surveyed, uh, believe that uh, only uh, a few American evangelicals care about the lives of minorities. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's tragic. That, that you took the word out of my mouth. That's what I was going to say. It's tragic. It's absolutely yeah. tragic. Um, yes, we should be about. Now the we're unborn. talking perception we here. Right. I, I want our listeners to understand this isn't necessarily reflective of reality. Uh, this is the perception. This is how people are perceiving us, and uh, and uh, I think that there's value as we uh, engage with people in in different areas uh, to understand how they look at us. And not that we have to strive to change that perception. Oftentimes we can't change perception. But if there's some correlation between what our brothers and sisters are perceiving about us from what they've observed in us doing or not doing, then, then we should be listening to that and asking ourselves the questions, not being defensive, uh, but asking our, the, ourselves the questions is their perception correct? And uh, and I think what we're seeing played out in our society is that um, more often than not, their perceptions are correct about us. You know, so much of this, Michael, I'm, I'm thinking back to now, to last Wednesday, I'm thinking about what happened in Washington, DC. Here's the facts, Here, here's the reality, whatever somebody else wants to try to tell us or try to explain it away. The people that were there on Wednesday were part of conspiracy theorists. Um, they were neo-Nazis. They were white supremacist groups. They know them. They know the names of these people. Um, they've been able to identify some of the leaders of these groups. I understand it doesn't apply to everyone in that crowd, but those were the majority. There was a there was a high. There was a number of them there, right? And they seem to be the agitators and the instigators. And um, so how much, how much of last week was really this, this notion of this idea of a rejection of social justice? And then, which is an answer you and I may not have today, 
But then on top of it, how does the church respond? Yeah, I mean, that's what hopefully the, the Sunday was about, uh, is the church working through its its identity, really. I mean, this is what this is about. It's who are we going to allow to define us, for one, and uh, are we going to allow moments like that to be a part of that definition? And um, it's unfortunate that, again, I mean, a lot of this is perception, Um but as I said, it, we need to evaluate that perception and ask ourselves um, how much of that is true. And if there is anything true about it, then how do we change as, as a church? Um, one of the other questions, Matt, and I think this is one that interests you, is I asked the question of these internationals, uh, two questions. One was, um, are American evangelicals examples to follow? And uh, 77% of internationals said no. They disagreed or somewhat disagreed with that statement that American evangelicals are examples to follow. That was heartbreaking uh, to me. Um, More so than the second question. The second question was that um, evangelicals in my country desire to be like even uh, desire to be like American evangelicals. And uh, over 60%, 64% of the international survey said that they disagree with that statement. You know, people in their countries do not want to be like American evangelicals. Um, and I, I mean, that tells us something. Uh, and as I think about the implications of this in terms of missions, and again, the, um, the United States sends more missionaries into the world than any country. Um, are we, are we, yeah, I mean, what does that say about us yeah. uh, and our level of credibility in the eyes of the people that we're working with? Uh, but here's, yeah. Yeah. So, here's how I react to it. And, and I guess I'm just going to say it like this. There, there are actually two reactions to that. Um, and it depends on the person when they hear that. Um, you can posture up and say they don't know what they're talking about. You could posture up and say, They are the ones that need to be taught, showed, we know the way. Or we can have a different posture and we can sit down, Mm -hmm. we can can humble ourselves, we can repent, and we can realize that we have ceased to lead. We are not leading. And if we're not leading, and if if internationally people are not looking to us, not, not that they need to, right? But if we're not leading, perhaps in other areas, then how are we not leading in our own, in our own mm-hmm. camp? And I think we see that being played out today. I, I, it's, it's so clear to me that we have stopped to lead. We have ceased leading. Um, we're, we're not, we're not leading anymore. And uh, we have lost that. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. I, I agree, Matt. I think, you know, the, I think we continue, I, I think I'd put it this way. Um, and I think this is what you're getting at. We, we continue to lead but we've lost our ability to be leaders um, or we've lost our credibility to be leaders. Uh, we're trying hard to do that. And, um, but the, our level of credibility has really tanked over the past decade or so. And that is, that is heartbreaking um, yeah. to, to think about that. But again, I mean, this is a survey that uh, is still ongoing uh, I'm hoping that we'll get more input from others, but in terms of the preliminary results, uh, there are points of encouragement, uh, but points where they we're beginning to recognize uh, some weaknesses. And as I think about weaknesses, whether they're corporate or personal, I, I think about those as opportunities of places where we can grow and really be the people who God intends us to be. And so I think, you know, there still is hope there for us. Um, you know, I, I, I think God desires to continue to use us as American evangelicals. Um, but I think that we need to be a little bit more open to listening to uh, what people perceive about us. And, and taking that as an opportunity to grow in our walks with the Lord. 
Mm-hmm. Amen to that. Amen to that. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that we are um, as difficult as this time feels, as hard, as confusing, um, as frustrating and demoralizing <laughs> as it can be. <laughs> wow, Matt, wonderful adjectives. Thanks so much for an uplifting end. No, I, <laughs> I think that this really can, I think this is a moment. I, I really do. And, and I think we have to sit in this, this feeling of being in exile for a little while. I think we just got to live there. And I think that's the place. This is our home right now. And we're going to have to embrace it. And um, I think we just need to, we're, we're going to walk through it, but this is how God goes about in restoring all things to him. And I, I really do believe this is the opening for the church and those who choose, those who choose to walk in it, walk through it, to remain faithful and, and the leaders that will come out of this uh, truly seeking this, this theocentric mission and mindset, the new, the movement will begin again and uh, it will be renewed. It will be restored. It will be better. And, um, but we need to hold, we got to hold firm and, and we, we're, there's going to be a lot of competition uh, for your attention, for your ears, for your eyes, for your soul um, and for your love. But this is, I think really the, the beginning of something new and exciting, but we'd be kidding ourselves if it's all going to be sunshine and rainbows um, after the election. Mm-hmm. And, and, and this has nothing to do with the election. I mean, it's the, it's part of it. I'm sorry. I, I said election, I meant inauguration, but you know what I meant, but this yep. isn't about waiting for that moment at all. It's going to be rough. The, the waters have been tainted. This is going to be a, a difficult season. Um, but I do believe that the best is still yet to come. I, I, you know, I have that sense of hope, too. I, I think Wednesday was so shocking to many people. And, uh, and you know, with the continued uh, the continuing voices of connecting what happened on Wednesday with Christianity. Um, I think people are beginning to wake up and see, gosh, you know what, that, that doesn't represent who I am as a Christian. And so, you know, it could have been a, uh, uh, an event that God used to grab our attention once again. And, and uh, just like he's been trying to do for the past year. Um, and I hope that we, we hear and we listen and uh, we begin to reflect and change and repent and change uh, so that God can revitalize us and use us as his instruments to declare his glory around the world. Amen. Amen. Well, thanks, Michael. This has been good. Andrew, if you're listening, we miss you, brother. We'll see you next time, hopefully. (laughs) Well, thanks for doing Theology and Community with us on the Ephesiology Podcast. Uh, We're glad that you are part of the growing Ephesiology global community. Learn more about Ephesiology and get access to free missional resources for you, your church, and leadership teams at Ephesiology.com. And so for Michael and myself, we'll talk again next week right here on the Ephesiology Podcast.